Hello and welcome to Science View, where we cover the latest advances in Japanese science and technology. I'm your navigator, Tomoko Kimura, and this week's science watcher is Dr. Eiji Mizushima from the University of Tsukuba. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us. And here is today's lineup. Today on The Leading Edge, we'll be covering space elevators. And on J Innovators, Michelle? I'll be introducing a Takumi who came up with an innovative technique to freeze dry a traditional seasoning that Japanese can't do without. But first, we'll begin with today's science news watch, Dr. Mizushima. I was interested in the news that a major Japanese automobile manufacturer used its own humanoid robot technology to develop a walking assistance robot for elderly people and those with decreased muscle strength. It is a wearable robot that is attached from the hip to the thigh. A sensor attached to the back detects hip joint movement, while a motor assists the stepping motion. It uses the walking technology that was developed for a humanoid robot and is easy to put on. It will be used for rehabilitation under the supervision of a doctor. The walking management systems will be leased to medical institutions in Japan from November 2015 for a monthly fee of about 450 US dollars. Head developer Hisahiro Ito said that its functions will continue to be improved based on user feedback. A venture company in Tsukuba City, Ibaragi Prefecture, has already begun selling wearable robot suits, and other car manufacturers are also putting strength into wearable robot development. Assistant devices like these need to be compact, light, and easy to operate. Simplifying products is an area that Japan excels in, so it may not be too long before wearing robots is as common as wearing clothes. And now for the leading edge. This week's leading edge is about space elevators. Let's start by finding out what a space elevator is. This is a place directly on the equator sometime in the future. A family arrives at a facility in the middle of the ocean. They're here to take a day trip to space. But what they're climbing into isn't a rocket. It's a futuristic vehicle that travels up a cable into space, a space elevator. It climbs at a speed of 200 kilometers per hour. Its destination is at an altitude of 400 kilometers, which is as high as the International Space Station. Earth's full magnificence is visible below. A week's trip will bring passengers to geostationary orbit which is 36,000 kilometers above the Earth's surface. If the space elevator becomes a reality, it could revolutionize space development. It would be so thrilling to take an elevator up into space. And because you don't need any special training, anyone can go. Yes, another advantage of a space elevator is that it will lower costs. Right now, the only way to travel into space is with a rocket. Fuel makes up 90% of the rocket's weight, so it's extremely expensive. According to one trial calculation, it costs about 10,000 US dollars for a rocket to carry one kilogram to the International Space Station, which is at an altitude of 400 kilometers. With a space elevator, the cost drops to about $100. So it would be an astounding technological accomplishment. But how will they go about building a space elevator? First of all, they need a cable to take the elevator up. Let's see how they plan to install it. Would it be possible to use a rocket to extend a cable? From Earth's surface, it looks like the rocket is rising in a straight line. 
However, it's actually orbiting Earth as it gains altitude. This method would not work as the cable would become tangled around Earth. What about lowering a cable from above? Let's say we were to lower a cable from the International Space Station, or ISS, which orbits Earth at an altitude of 400 kilometers. The ISS is actually moving at a speed of 8 kilometers per second. It would be a disaster if the cable were to scrape the ground at that speed. So how can it be done? A solution was proposed by Yuri Artsutanov, a Russian scientist. His idea was to use a geostationary orbit at an altitude of 36,000 kilometers. The speed at which a satellite orbits Earth is determined by its altitude. At an altitude of 400 kilometers, it will travel at a speed of 8 kilometers per second and orbit Earth 16 times per day. The higher the altitude, the slower it travels. At an altitude of 10,000 kilometers, it will orbit Earth roughly four times per day. At a geostationary orbit of 36,000 kilometers, a satellite will orbit Earth exactly once a day. Because the satellite travels in sync with the Earth's rotation, from Earth's surface, it appears to be still. Artsutanov believed that Earth and space could be safely connected by a cable lowered from geostationary orbit and published his idea in 1960. Then in 2012, the Japanese construction company that built Tokyo Skytree announced its plan to build a space elevator. Work will begin in 2025. It's scheduled for completion in 2050, and the project is expected to cost 100 billion U.S. dollars. That's exciting. So a Japanese company announced an actual plan to construct a space elevator. Yes, I think they are the first company in the world to present such a definite and detailed plan. But a geostationary orbit is 36,000 kilometers above Earth. How will they be able to extend a cable that far? Actually, according to the current space elevator plans, they would need a longer cable. The length would be more than double and it would be 96,000 kilometers. Let's find out why they need such a long cable and how they plan to construct that cable in space. The first step of the construction process is to send a spacecraft into geostationary orbit with a rocket. A cable will then be lowered from the spacecraft. However, with this method, Gravity will attract the dangling cable and pull the spacecraft out of geostationary orbit. So another cable will be extended from the opposite side as a counterweight. By the time the cable reaches the ground, the opposite tip will be 96,000 kilometers away. And there are other factors to consider. A simulation created by Yoshiki Yamagiwa of Shizuoka University demonstrated one of them. The cable is affected by Earth's rotation and will not descend in a straight line. When you deploy a cable from geostationary orbit, the cable moves in the same direction as Earth's rotational direction, which is towards the east, so it will drop sideways. They learned that the cable would move to the side instead of dropping vertically. When the cable is lowered, it will need some kind of weight at the end and some sort of thruster so that we can control the direction and speed. 
When the extended cable begins to sway to the side, the engine of the thruster attached to the tip starts up and adjusts its trajectory. It will travel towards Earth at a speed of 15 kilometers per hour. When the atmosphere begins drawing it in, a balloon will be opened to slow it down. It will reach Earth in about 100 days and be secured to the ground, creating a connection between Earth and space. Due to the weight issue, the initial cable that will be taken up in the rocket is not strong enough to support an elevator. This is where climbers carrying reinforcing cables will be used. The climbers will be sent up to reinforce and complete the cable. I see. So they will make the cable stronger by layering it. Yes. Each cable is very thin and only a few centimeters wide. The plan is to combine hundreds of these cables together to create a 7,000 ton cable. And how long will the construction of this cable take? According to the current plan, they will be constructing the cable from 2030 to 2050. The whole construction period is 25 years, so most of the time is spent on constructing the cable. So far, we've seen how they plan to make the cable. However, there's a problem that needs to be solved before this can be done. Take a look. The issue is with the climber's power source. The climbers are what the passengers will ride in, and the idea is to power them with electricity. Yet there is no power source up in space. Loading a battery onto a climber would weigh it down and hinder its ascent. The climbers need an external source of energy. But how would they deliver energy to the climbers? Supported by NASA, Ben Shalef has been studying how to power the climbers. Shalef proposes the use of laser beams. Because laser beams don't disperse easily, they'll be able to supply the climbers with energy even from a far distance. And we take a laser beam and we shoot all the way to here. We illuminate the climber. And we can put a lot more light here. It's going to get a lot brighter than sunlight. Hits the solar panels, gets back to being electricity, and then it runs the little motors that drive it out. First, solar panels will be attached to the climbers. Then a laser beam will be shown onto the panels from Earth. The solar panel will convert the laser beam into electricity, which will be used to power the climber. Shalef has collaborated with universities and companies and is holding experiments on propelling climbers with laser beams. As you can see, the laser beam is hitting the underside of the climber. In this experiment, they succeeded in elevating the climber to a height of 1,000 meters. However, laser beams have a weakness. Thick clouds or strong rain can block the laser beams and shut down electricity production. Using laser beams as a power source seems like a good idea, but they are easily affected by the weather. Is there a solution for this? Yes, they are considering different options. For example, to build multiple power beaming facilities in various locations so that they can hit the climber from where the sky is clear. Another idea is to shine a laser from geostationary orbit. Each option has its pros and cons, and new technologies will be needed to be developed. I heard that there are other issues that need to be solved before a space elevator can become a reality, and one of them is the cable material. Dr. Mizushima, could you tell us more about this issue? Yes, of course. The cable needs to be about 100,000 kilometers long. But the materials we currently have are not strong enough 
and will break under their own weight. Until now, the lack of a viable material kept the space elevator project from being feasible. You said until now. Does this mean that they've found a promising material for the cable? Yes, here yeah, it is. It's a form of carbon called carbon nanotube. It was discovered in 1991 by a Japanese scientist. With carbon nanotubes, the carbon atoms have a cylindrical structure and an extremely strong bond with each other. Carbon nanotubes are just one-fifth the weight of iron, yet are said to be 20 times stronger. That's impressive. So it's the perfect material for the cable. But there is still a problem that needs to be cleared. It's extremely difficult to create a length of carbon nanotubes, and so far they've been only be able to make two centimeters. Going from two centimeters to 100,000 kilometers is a big stretch. However, it's been said that this is simply because there wasn't a need for it. Technology advances at an astonishing rate when there is a high demand for it. So, like the climate's power source, we may see research progress at a rapid pace. We used to think that space elevators existed only in science fiction. Now that it may be realized, what sort of future can we look forward to? Computer graphics give us a sneak preview. Tourists looking to take a space trip will be able to travel as high as 400 kilometers, which is the same altitude as the International Space Station. The areas higher than that would be reserved for space development. The construction of a space elevator is expected to open up new possibilities and speed up space development. A station will be constructed at geostationary orbit and serve as the space elevator's base. The station will be in a weightless state to maintain a balance between gravity and centrifugal force. This weightless environment is expected to be used for research. Massive solar panels will also be installed to power the station. Now let's travel a bit further. Fifty-seven thousand kilometers from Earth is the Mars Gate. Due to its distance from Earth, it's moving one and a half times faster than the station at geostationary orbit. This speed will be used to launch spacecrafts to Mars. The space elevator will end 96,000 kilometers from Earth. This point will be used as a port for spacecrafts that will travel to planets and asteroids that are beyond Mars. The scale of this project is literally out of this world. If a space elevator is completed, then the overall cost of space development will drop drastically. For example, in the event that a second elevator is built, the first elevator will be able to carry materials up and the construction cost will be substantially lower. Constructing several space elevators wouldn't be a far off dream. And that would in turn speed up the space business and space development. Yes, cost and safety are major issues that need to be addressed if we are to explore the moon or make Mars habitable like Earth. However, with the realization of a space elevator, it might not be long before these ideas become feasible. As of now, we can only utilize resources on Earth. A space elevator could help us bring space resources to Earth. The depletion of Earth's resources is a serious problem, and a space elevator could provide a solution, or the key to it.
We came to Aomori City, Aomori Prefecture in northeastern Japan. Hi, I'm Michelle. Are you familiar with freeze drying? It's a method to dry food while keeping the nutrients almost intact. Today I'm going to meet a Takumi innovator who takes the technology to a whole new stage. Let's go meet him. Hello. Hi. I'm Michelle Yamamoto. I'm Akitaya. Welcome. Today's Takumi is Nobuyuki Akitaya. We went right in to see his innovative product. Is this it? Yes, it is. What is it? The freeze-dried product looks a lot like gravel. What could it be? Adding water will return it to its original state. Here we go. Mmm, it smells really good. Is this miso? Yes, that's right. It's freeze-dried miso in granulated form that retains its original flavor and aroma. Miso is a traditional Japanese seasoning that is produced by fermenting soybeans. The most popular way to use miso is in a soup. First, a broth is made with kelp or fish, and various ingredients are added to it. Finally, the miso paste is mixed in. It's a very simple dish, but it takes time to prepare it well. On the other hand, with freeze-dried miso, you just have to place it in a bowl and pour hot water over it. It takes just 10 seconds to prepare. And when we compared its taste to that of normal miso, there's no difference. The aroma hasn't changed either. They're exactly the same. This is impressive. Oh, thank you. It retains its rich taste and aroma, and there's no indication that it's been freeze-dried. The freeze-dried miso is produced by a well-established miso maker. It was developed to promote miso. However, it was not an easy task. Freeze drying is a technique used to dry food ingredients in a vacuum tank at a temperature below the freezing point. Yet, the miso took a long time to dry. Here's a graph. As you can see, it took about 20 hours to dry. And a problem arose during the drying process. The amino acid and glucose in miso would bond together. Because of this, the freeze-dried miso didn't taste good. After much thought, the Takumi added a new device to the vacuum tank. It was a cylinder to push out the miso. As you can see, it looks a lot like spaghetti. The miso is then cut into very small pieces by a high-speed cutter before it enters the vacuum tank. The Takumi's idea was to shorten the drying time by cutting it into small pieces and increasing the surface area. However, the miso didn't come out neatly at first. Because there was too much moisture, the miso that he placed in the cylinder would get stuck. The Takumi then thought of pre-drawing the miso. But determining the degree to which the miso should be dried took a lot of experimentation. This is the condition that the Takumi found to be ideal. It appears to be dry and has little stickiness. However, we weren't told the details as they are a trade secret. By incorporating these methods, he was able to reduce the drying time to 8 hours, which is less than half the time it used to take. By shortening the time during which the flavor and aroma changed, they were able to preserve the miso's quality. 
we asked Takumi for the secret to his success. Of course, there were times when things went wrong, but part of success is being able to see those times as valuable experiences rather than failures. You just have to persist until you succeed. I brought the Takumi's freeze-dried miso to the studio. All you need to do now is add hot water. Please try it. Okay, here we go, Dr. Mizushima. It seems to melt right away. Mm -hmm. And you should mix it well. Can you smell the aroma? Mm. Mm. It smells very good. Mm hmm. Mm. This is very nice. It's my mother's miso soup. <laughs> really? <laughs> okay, I'm going to have some too. Mm. You know, I've had freeze-dried miso soup before, but this is really tasty. And because it has a long shelf life, I think it would be great for stocking it up for natural disasters. Great idea. And the Takumi's miso can also be used as a seasoning. Although miso consumption is slowly declining in Japan, the Takumi believes that a good idea and high-quality product will attract consumers. Adaptability and diversity are important factors in manufacturing. Although they are a long-standing company, they are working to stay relevant and create new innovations. Thank you very much, Michelle. So, Dr. Mizushima, going back to today's topic on space elevators, how would you wrap it up? New technologies will be needed, and it will be a very complex project. Yet, many researchers and technicians are working to make the concept of a space elevator a reality. Given mankind a dream is one of science's roles, and I personally hope that it will be made very soon. I look forward to seeing how a space elevator will change our lives and the new worlds that it will open up to us. That's all for this week's Science View. See you next time.